Today, we are talking about the OG queen of cottagecore, Laura Ashley. Cottagecore has been a very popular aesthetic on TikTok and the internet in general these past few years. But cottagecore is not just an internet invention, the name, the label cottagecore, probably, but romanticizing an idyllic country life through fashion, interior design, cooking, and entertainment. It's not new. Many people actually attribute Marie Antoinette as being the OG cottagecore queen. She did have a rural retreat built for her on the grounds of Versailles where she could go and cosplay as a peasant for the day. A beautiful peasant, but a peasant nonetheless. But there is no denying that in the 1980s, Laura Ashley was the reigning queen of cottagecore. Laura Ashley was born in 1925 in Wales and growing up she was very influenced by her idyllic countryside surroundings and she learned quilting from her grandmother. In the early 1950s she started their textile business with her husband Bernard Ashley out of their small London flat. She would screen print the fabric by hand in the flat and make it into things like tea towels, scarves, aprons and garden smocks. Her products featured intricate floral prints reminiscent of the English countryside, as well as patterns influenced by the 1920s arts and crafts movement. By the late 1960s, the business had grown and they moved their manufacturing back to Wales. They opened a factory there. They'd also opened their first London store and started designing women's fashion. Laura Ashley was selling more conservative, longer length midi dresses rather than the mini skirts that were very, very popular in the 1960s. But Laura Ashley, they were doing something different. And this is really the beginning of the prairie dress trend that became extremely popular in the 1970s. Prairie dresses were midi or full length dresses with high necklines, flouncy arms, and often adorned with lace and ruffles. There was also another brand called Gunny Sacks that made these prairie dresses, but they're an American brand. I think they were from San Francisco. They were much more American pioneer, Wild West settler chic, rather than Laura Ashley ones that were very English, traditional, Victorian era type dresses. Personally, my favorite kind of prairie dresses were the polyester fluoro prom prairie dresses. Like you would not want to get near an open flame in these things. In 1971, Laura Ashley's daughter Jane started taking the campaign photographs for the catalogs. What Jane did was she set up these photos that felt very candid and yet also like a bit of an element of fantasy at the same time. Like this is how you could feel if you bought the dress. She would either shoot in the Laura Ashley stores or in a country setting and normally just used her friends and would just photograph them having a great time in the dresses. A lot of her photography also felt like a real historic image. It was sort of like a period drama, a period piece, but in photography form. And this type of imagery really worked for Laura Ashley because the designs were very historically inspired, very inspired by the Victorian era and the Edwardian era in particular. The photography style was very sentimental, very romantic, and this dreamy campaign imagery really worked. It really made it look like these models were in some kind of English romance story that you wanted to be a part of too. One of Laura Ashley's signature design elements was the sailor collar. The sailor collar with a square bib and the contrast, is it called piping? or just at least, you know, contrast stripes. Obvi, it began as a naval uniform. Then it became extremely popular towards the late 19th century as children's wear because it was very neat, but it also was very sturdy. You know, it's giving Von Trapp children. It was also associated with leisure wear and summer activities for women. The sailor collar became extremely popular in the 1980s because of Laura Ashley, and it actually made a mini comeback a couple of years ago in 2021. It was sort of a micro trend that we saw on the runway, uh, especially with Miu Miu. Miu Miu is Prada. Laura Ashley would make very traditional colorways, navy, white, maybe a red. They would also do more fun 80s bright pink colors, but then they also made the sailor dresses with their signature floral prints and normally with a big bow at the chest. 
They also made dresses with nautical stripes that were very inspired by those British seaside resorts. It's very like, hmm, she's looking very sallow. Let's send her to the seaside to take in the fresh air. <laughs> Other historically inspired elements Flora Ashley used were lace collars, lace cuffs, also scalloped edges, which had been fairly popular in the 1860s and then became very, very popular in the 1920s. Laura Ashley was quite inspired by the 1920s as well, as well as some of the prints being inspired by the 1920s arts and crafts movement. A lot of the silhouettes Laura Ashley used were very 1920s with the drop waists. The models would also be styled in a very 1920s way with the headscarf and the string of pearls. The whole 80s does 20s in fashion is very interesting to me. As we know, fashion is very cyclical. Everything old always becomes new again, but there's something about the 80s does 20s. It just really tickles my fashion brain, especially 1980s evening wear had a very flapper feel. Drop waist, polka dots, embroidery and beading. They were basically flapper dresses just with massive shoulder pads. In the Laura Ashley photo shoots, the models would almost always be styled with headwear. So a hat, a scarf, a flower crown, and they're also often styled with white accessories, white shoes, white gloves, white bags, and white tights. Oh boy, did they love a white tight. And it definitely gives an air of innocence. A way that they did modernize these historic silhouettes were doing open backs with a big bow right above the tushy. A lot of the evening dresses that they made in taffeta and velvet had these gorgeous low backs. And they did these, especially for the Christmas season, they would make these Christmas party dresses, normally in velvet, burgundies and reds and forest greens. It's just so Christmassy, I love it. So another big part of Laura Ashley were the wedding dresses and the bridesmaid dresses. The Laura Ashley bridal collection, again, very historically inspired. And you could really pick your era. Like, what were you feeling? Were you feeling like an Edwardian bride with a boda hat and a parasol? Or were you a 1920s bride with a tiara across your forehead and a lace boxy drop waist gown? Like, you could really just pick whatever era you were going for as long as your hair was sufficiently 80s permed. And then the bridesmaid dresses were normally these pastel taffeta gowns, maybe with some ruffles. It's serving for weddings and a funeral. Love it. By 1984, Laura Ashley had over 220 stores worldwide, as well as concessions in international department stores. The brand had also expanded into being a more all-encompassing lifestyle brand, especially in the homewares department. They had bedding, cushions, wallpaper, kitchenware, like you could really surround yourself in Laura Ashley if you're so pleased. They also sold sewing patterns with McCall's and their catalog business was booming. Catalog orders in the 70s and 80s were extremely important for fashion businesses. It's kind of the equivalent of online shopping today. Like you would have your bricks and mortar store and then hopefully getting lots of mail orders through the catalogs. And catalog sales a lot of the time determined how you could scale your business, get more investors, and then in turn open more retail stores. Another thing that catapulted Laura Ashley even further globally was the Princess Diana effect. Before Princess Diana's engagement to Prince Charles, she was photographed where she worked at a local kindergarten wearing a Laura Ashley skirt. And there's a little bit of a mini scandal about this because in the photographs, it was actually backlit. The sun was like shining through her skirt and it made it see through and you could see the outline of her legs. I know, scandalous, right? A woman's legs and the outline of a woman's legs. We should not have to see that. But if Princess Diana was wearing army pants and flip-flops, we are wearing army pants and flip-flops too. It's a lot like Princess Catherine now, like anything she wears, people immediately go out and buy the exact item. Not that I would ever do that. Like that would be so weird doing that. Princess Diana continued to wear Laura Ashley pieces throughout the 80s and into the 90s. And actually Laura Ashley kind of encapsulates what Princess Diana was all about and the image that she created. She was this English rose wearing these very traditional, historically inspired pieces that were made in Britain. That's very important that Laura Ashley was made in Wales. 
all of the Laura Ashley tags say made in Great Britain. I did find one tag when I was just looking at vintage pieces online that said made in the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong, which I guess at the time, you know, like that's still technically, like it's an, a British outpost, you know? Also, here is a very young Gwyneth Paltrow wearing Laura Ashley. I really didn't know where else to slot this in the video, but I wanted to show it because I think it's really sweet. And she was about 12 or 13 years old here. And it just goes to show that for a teen or, or a tween, uh, Laura Ashley was trendy. It was cool. Before she went all goopy, like Laura Ashley was it. Very sadly in 1985, Laura Ashley actually passed away. She fell down the stairs at her home in Wales. I read an interview with her daughter, Jane, the same uh, daughter who'd taken those early campaign images. And she said that after her mother passed away, it just wasn't the same anymore. Like they didn't have the fun energy of a family business collaborating together, like her mom, just wasn't there anymore and it was different obviously. Going into the 1990s, this is what I personally am calling the Miss Honey era for Laura Ashley, like Miss Honey from the 90s uh, Matilda movie. Maybe it's something about the grain of the film photography used in the 90s that's just really evoking Miss Honey to me. But all these images, they're just very wholesome and sunny. Lots of florals and sunshine and hats with the brim upturned. Towards the late 1990s, this is when Laura Ashley sadly went into a decline. At this time, that grungy fashion was very popular, like the black leather jackets and the brown lipstick. And you know, that is just the antithesis of what Laura Ashley is all about. And yeah, unfortunately, the love of Laura Ashley just kind of died out. They also had a few legal disputes and that financially impacted the company and they had to close stores and it just sort of, yeah, just sort of disappeared and died away, which is really sad. So where are we at today? Like, What is the state of Laura Ashley? They did get bought out by another like retail group. And in 2021, they decided to relaunch the homewares side of the business. So on the Laura Ashley website right now, you can buy like the bedding, the cushions, the wallpaper. Um, I think they do make children's wear. And this year they're actually celebrating their 70th anniversary. So they have a 70th anniversary collection out. As far as women's fashion though, they aren't making it themselves anymore, but they are collaborating with other brands. In 2019, they did a collaboration with Urban Outfitters where they sort of lended the classic Laura Ashley prints to more millennial designs. The capsule collection featured mini dresses in vintage prints, ruffle blouses and baby doll silhouettes, all realized in a romantic organza and chiffon. They've continued to collaborate with brands. They've done a collaboration with Barbar, Rag and Bone. Currently they have a collaboration with Lucky Brand. I have a little bit of a soft spot for Lucky Brand, mainly because my dog was called Lucky. But also I have a pair of Lucky Brand jeans that I bought, it's gotta be pushing 10 years ago and I still wear them and they're still great. But I do think the most harmonious collaboration that they have done is with the New York designer label Batsheva. The designer behind the brand, Batsheva Hay, it's an eponymous brand. Um, she was actually inspired to start her business after, what did she say? She said she was wearing her vintage Laura Ashley to threads. And you can really see the influence of Laura Ashley on her designs, not just the collaboration pieces, but all of them. Batsheva, she loves a sailor collar. She loves a bit of lace, um, a prairie slash pioneer dress. And for the most recent collaboration that she's done with Laura Ashley, I think she's done four, and this is the 70th anniversary collaboration. So she specifically went back into old Laura Ashley catalogs and decided to recreate some of the seaside imagery. And you can definitely see her fun New York Coney Island take on some of those traditional English seaside images. Now, if you are interested in some authentic vintage Laura Ashley pieces, then there are lots for sale on websites like eBay and on Etsy. Some of it can be quite expensive, uh, especially if you want it in good condition. But from my understanding, Laura Ashley was kind of always a little bit expensive anyway, back in the day. It was definitely like pieces that you had to save up for. I'm kind of surprised that Laura Ashley hasn't made more of a comeback on the fashion side of things, considering how big cottagecore has been and continues to be. And of course they've been doing these collaborations with these other brands, but I feel like 
This recent cottagecore phenomenon would have just been the perfect time to relaunch the fashion side of the business in a bigger way. That's easier said than done though. Like that's me just sitting here saying that. <laughs> Obviously there's a lot that goes into it. But yeah, maybe there's just not so much of an appetite for Laura Ashley particularly anymore because there are so many other brands filling the cottage core shoes. Brands like Love Shack Fancy, which is literally just Laura Ashley for Gen Zs, For Love and Lemons, Doen, this is a Doen dress. These are all sort of more high-end ones, but then even fast fashion brands like End Other Stories, they do cottage core pieces a lot. So yeah, maybe the cottage core boots have been filled. If you did enjoy today's video, please remember to give it a like and also feel free to subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.